Sorry. Can everyone get your attention, please? Can everyone please go ahead and take a seat? We're going to go ahead and get started with the formal part of the presentation, and there'll be time afterwards to walk around and look at the boards again. My name is Alan Stevenson. I'm the Acting Director for the Planning and Development Department, and I am uh, here this evening to uh, be your moderator and also at this time to introduce Councilwoman Laura Pastor, who's going to give us a few opening remarks. Thank you. part of this whole process because it's uh, been a long process and they have worked very hard diligently in making sure that it was delivered in the, in the proper way. So I wanted to thank our city staff that is here this evening and if you can give them a round of applause, that'd be great. being here on a Friday night. I just left a uh, my little girl's t-ball uh, game to, to be able to welcome you and I'm so excited that you're here tonight on a Friday night. Now I'm going to do a plug for District 4 as we all live in District 4 and those that don't. Uh, we have this whole corridor that uh, has many restaurants that are more than what that are welcoming you to come and eat and have some adult beverages. So after this, please, uh, please uh, join those establishments or go to those establishments and uh, and support our local economy. Because as you know, we have a budget going on, and I'm about generating revenue, and we need to spend some of our dollars. So uh, thank you if you would do that. Uh, it's been a great two weeks. Because we have had an opportunity, and I believe it's once in a lifetime opportunity, I don't know if I'll ever see it again, to be able to create and reinvent Phoenix. And really see and have a voice of what we're doing today. It's nice to see the multi-generations here from those that have uh, been here and have seen the past and those that are here to, to create the future and are part of the future with innovative and creative ideas. So it's really exciting times and I'm, I'm excited in the fact that it's so exciting because we have so many ideas that we would like to put forth and what we want to see Phoenix be like. I want to thank uh, all my colleagues that sit with me that believe in this because it's really about our future. So it's great to see young people being part of this and uh, understanding this whole process. So once again, thank you. I see Gigi out there. Gigi's always a, a part of everything. And I've served with Gigi on, on the, in Kennel Village. Like thank Gary, Charlie, AJ, who are all over, and, and all of you for being here. It's so exciting. For me, it's exciting. What I'm also going to plug is over there, there's a photo booth. And uh, as I was walking in, uh, I was like, what is that? And they said the photo booth. So I decided to go experiment with the photo booth. I'm not sure if I like my pictures, but that's OK. So please experiment uh, with the photo booth, because we can capture this moment and uh, place it in our history. So once again, Enjoy, have fun, it's Friday night. Good night. Well, a couple of quick announcements. There are restrooms and food upstairs if you haven't been there. Uh, go ahead and, and please uh, help yourself as you need to with that as well. Um, we are uh, privileged this evening to also uh, have Stephanie Smelnick, who's the director of the uh, Phoenix Multi-Family Program. Uh, for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I know many of you know that uh, this project is, would not be possible without the $2.9 million HUD grant that we received. So let me welcome her up here now for... Thank you and good evening. It's lovely to see everyone tonight. I am with HUD and this is what we live for, planning and community development. But first, I'd like to acknowledge my architect, Nicole Green Catton, here. Stand up, Nicole. Not only does Nicole review 
projects that come into our office, but she's also a sustainable community officer, and she has her LEED certification, and she is she lives eats, eats and breathes this stuff. So I'm always happy to have her. She's my connection. The mission of HUD is to create strong, sustainable communities by connecting housing to jobs, fostering local innovation, and helping to build a clean energy economy. I have to share something with you. When I was nine years old, I joined the Save the Planet. Um, club, and that's been my thing ever since. I was recycling before it was cool, and this kind of innovation and sustainability is what we want to do and what we're going to move forward with. This grant provided by the HUD Office of Sustaining Housing and Community is going to help achieve this with our great partners, the City of Phoenix, Arizona State University, and St. Luke's Health Initiatives and many others. Together we can make this happen for the benefit of everyone in the community. Congratulations to everyone here on all the hard work. And of course I'm already asking, Alan, when are we going to start? When, when is the implementation going? Come on. And he's like, okay, hold on, hold on. We're still planning. We're still planning. So congratulations and I'm really excited to see this. In just a minute, we are going to have uh, Galena come up and walk us through the uh, designs that uh, the group has come up with um, over this last two weeks. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and thank Cohen Van Lu uh, Consultants. They're the owners of this building, uh, as well as Shepley Bullfinch Architects. They're the tenant, and they have let us use it for this project. This uh, entire building uh, has been free of charge, so we've been using it. Uh, the design team has been here, as many of you know, who have attended a lot of the meetings, been here for the entire two weeks, um, and they did that uh, all because they believe in uh, downtown Phoenix and they believe in this project. And so with that, we're going to try this video again for those of you that were here the first time. Uh, told us ready to go and work this time. Great natural. 
natural light. So I think people are anxious to preserve the green bones, uh, but also have it be pretty simple and have it be a pretty simple intervention. As you all know, the design consultants have been in town for the last couple of weeks, and many of you attended a number of meetings that were held here. I just want to provide a little context for you so you understand where we're at in this process. Uh, tonight, you're going to see the, the designs that they've come up with over those last couple of weeks, and then uh, they're going to go back, um, and ultimately, they will deliver some uh, draft plans to us for the station areas. And so at that time, then we'll bring back some of those uh, stationary plans. They, each of those areas have a leadership committee that's been appointed that of um, property owners and business owners and residents who all live in those areas that will help provide some refinement to those plans and ultimately uh, the city's moving forward with uh, hoping to adopt those by the end of this year. So once we have those plans and after they work through uh, with some of the leadership groups, we'll have some more meetings to also um, provide some more information, give you all some opportunity to have some additional feedback in the process, and then they'll start that public hearing process through our village planning committees, planning commission, city council subcommittee, and ultimately to, to city council in the fall. Um, with that, I did want to go ahead and, uh, and jump right into the presentation. Uh, Galena is our lead designer here, and she's going to walk us through all of the, uh, the, pres the items they've come up with. And then after she's done with that presentation, uh, herself, uh, maybe a couple other design members, uh, myself, as well as Kurt Upton, the project manager, will be happy to, to sit here and answer any questions that you may have. And, uh, and you know, please continue to, uh, to stay involved in this process. I know, thank you all again for a Friday night being here. You may want to slip out a little bit early. That's certainly fine and, and understandable. Um, I would encourage you to continue visiting our website for all the information. We'll keep things up to date there as we move through this process. And with that, I'll turn over to Galena. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Lovely Phoenix evening, beautiful weather. Um, and we, we really enjoyed uh, working here for two weeks. And it has been a wonderful experience to be embedded in the heart of your urban corridor in Midtown. Um, uh, and uh, I had a great team with me, with, and I want you to see them right here. It's, uh, come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to share with them, uh, you know, the excitement of this evening and a little bit of the pressure, which is uh, <laughs> almost all of it on me. Uh, so I just wanted to go around and uh, present uh, the designers for the three districts. Uh, we had leaders and designers for the three uh, districts, uh, as well as uh, a team on the code, uh, and also some general support. Uh, we had uh, Javier Iglesias and uh, Brian Lemerman on Midtown. <laughs> Mike Houston with uh, Max Boschetti. In Solano, we had Edgar Bennett. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Danny's hiding. And Daniel, <laughs> and Daniel Mont Morales. So he will show up. We met together as a general support. She printed all of these boards for you to enjoy after the meeting. This reader who is uh, actually giving life to all of our two-dimensional drawings and to our thoughts as well as your thoughts and he creates the beautiful 3, 3D drawing so here, here we go. We have Matt Lambert who is also a partner at our company, our youngest partner and he was leading the code team. Drawings, but they're also probably the most important ones, ones because they are the law. They will be the ones which will make all of this happen. We had, of course, a great team of consultants. Uh, most of them left. They just, you know, they don't stay usually the whole time. 
uh, uh, placemakers with Susan Henderson. Uh, she was on the on the team. Uh, uh, other people from her office on the economic development team. Jim Charlier with his team on transportation. Uh, uh, we had a, the economic development team with Hazel Boris and with uh, with Scott Bernstein. I mean, it's there are many more. We have 12 subconsultant uh, firms uh, working with us on this big effort. So uh, it was a kind of a very a very large effort from many, many people. So thank you, guys. <laughs> we, we also have an interpreter here. If anybody needs any uh, interpretation, uh, see Judy right over there for Spanish language. Thank you. Okay, great. Maybe translation into English also. <laughs> If, if somebody is wondering, uh, my accent is from Eastern Europe. I'm from Bulgaria originally, so just if you're just wondering. <laughs> uh, but uh, this actually gives me a great advantage because I can always say that something was lost in translation. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here uh, we're showing a few images of the process of what we have been doing here for two weeks. Yes, this was our office and we spent a lot of uh, mornings and days and some nights. Um, and we had uh, great interaction, interaction actually with the neighborhoods, with the property owners, with stakeholders, with city staff. We had some meetings which were very technical in nature and we had some emotional meetings where uh, you were expressing your desires and your, uh, your concerns about the development of your community. Uh, and as we heard before, you know, the great thing is that we had a multi-generational representation. So this was, this was a wonderful feedback, so we are very thankful. We not only worked, but we also explored the city. You can see here the brave ones on bikes. So we, uh, we advocate a lot for biking, and this is a big part of our master plan. So uh, we were biking around, getting to know you and your city. We had a lot of fun on the weekend. Uh, we uh, went to the Sycamore Canyon, you know, saw the natural beauty of, uh, uh, of Arizona and the region. Uh, so it was uh, a lot of uh, a great, uh, a great fun. Uh, we will be really sad when we leave tomorrow morning, and I'm absolutely honest with you. One secret is that every time we do these things, we are sad to leave the place because two weeks or one week or whatever is is a short period of time, but usually really uh, quite a nice period of time to know many people, to know a place, to live a little bit in the city. And this was our goal that we will learn about the place through living it here. And uh, in the opening presentation, I made it many times through the through the through the week. I was talking about our excitement. Uh, on Phoenix and its history, and that we cannot detach our goals today from what we knew, from what we learned about the city, uh, from the, all the beautiful plans and the beautiful dreams which generations before you had. And the goal is that some of these, some of these dreams and some of these goals will be carried through the, to the to the next step. And don't. Uh, you know, don't uh, trust anybody who tells you that you don't. You have a very short history. Actually, that's not true. You know, it was actually multi thousands of years ago with the Hokokams who uh, brought the canals, and that's why we are here. Uh, so, you know, going through the 19th century and the 20th century, uh, through the mid-century, you have history. And uh, whether it's with old buildings or newer buildings, mid-century buildings. There are many things which we'll be building upon. And this is an image which I stole from uh, Mr. David uh, Creator, and I misspelled his name, so I'm just totally guilty. But here, you know, I'm just admitting all of that. It was a wonderful, wonderful slide, and he was talking about uh, the um, First Arizona, local First Arizona. We had a, an adaptive reuse forum here, and he was talking about uh, Phoenix, how Phoenix actually is very important for the bigger region. That uh, in the heart of, of Phoenix is its downtown, and now we are like making it. Uh, we are making it a linear, a linear downtown or, or a linear urban core, including uh, Midtown and Uptown and Solan. 
you know, this was a kind of the, the, uh, the history of, of the city till the time when there were some slightly crazy moments in your history. And I heard also from Gigi George, I, I don't know whether she's here, but she came and, and she talked to me about the history of preservation in the city and how it was started in the 70s. There were some really very bold ideas, ideas which were bringing the car in the center of the city and making it the main participant, the main actor. Actually, the humans and the bikers and the pedestrians were pushed aside and the main theatrical participant on the stage was the car. And this was probably the proof. But they were in historical neighborhoods who, you know, they stood up and they said, well, no, it's, you have to bear it. And they fought for like 20 years, so it was built really late. So today, again, you're a city of transition and I have been, you know, you know, nagging about that for a long time. You know, yes, you, are, you already have, have, you have embraced the idea of walkability and more sustainable life, more compact development, a different kind of growth which will match actually your different mode of transportation. Now you have the light rail which is so advanced not many cities in the country can be so happy to have such an incredible facility and such a, a state-of-the-art infrastructure. You have so many assets to build upon. Uh, not only your economic growth right now is great. Well, we know you started a little, you know, lower, and then, but you're now shooting up in the rankings. You know, you're among the ten uh, cities which are really doing well in jobs and uh, growing economy. You're also, I just read it yesterday in, in some, yesterday or the day before, in some article that you're basically the, uh, the city who is capturing a lot of the young talent, you know, the brain power cities. You're number 11 in the country out of all of these cities, you're number 11, which I was actually nicely, you know, very, very uh, happy to see. Well, this means that your young and talented and educated people choose to live here and they're making the change themselves. You know, they're doing adaptive reuse, uh, they're using old buildings for great things. I mean, you have these great cultural institutions, you have universities, you have ethnic diversity. I mean, you have everything. You have the great, uh, I said, the great infrastructure. What did I miss? I think that I missed the food. And we actually think that the food, the, the food culture which you are developing is a wonderful news for you. It is in all the great cities which were a kind of up and coming, you know, in history of planning from what I know, it's actually a very important element. This means that people already uh, realized that food and social life related to restaurants and uh, all of this uh, sociability is an important element. And we, believe me, we tried everything. We did the pilgrimage to the uh, guild tacos, I mean, everything, you know, the postinos, whatever you, we could find uh, in uh, Midtown and Uptown and, and Solano. So, as I said, reinvent Phoenix study area is a very important from a regional, from the regional point of view because the light rail connects the region. It connects Tempe, connects Phoenix all the way to Mesa. You're now expanding the light rail. So this, the strength of this spine actually will make the neighborhoods which are very close to this spine really very strong. This one I put to just to show you that the historic neighborhoods were here first. This is a picture from uh, a picture from Midtown, a very short a short uh, a stretch of Central between Osborne and Indian School. But as you can see, in 1959. The neighborhoods were here already, the residential neighborhoods. Then some of the big buildings, some of the businesses, the large businesses started coming out of downtown. And by the 70s, we already have this pattern of high, of high tall buildings. You see, in 1965, actually the building where we are here, we, you have it you know, half built, and now it's the whole thing. The good news is that we are completing the other circle, at least in plan. So it's, 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 we need to see it, uh, to see it uh, happening. This place here, the, the public space in front of this building is absolutely great. We enjoyed it during the week. It has the potential to become one of these uh, nodes along a Central Avenue. And then uh, these are the three districts which are concentrating on, which we concentrated on with this uh, study. We did Gateway and uh, Eastlake and Gar Garfield uh, in the past uh, several months. And these are three districts uh, which are the, uh, the heart of this linear downtown, which I was talking about uh, uh, our, our set. So we'll start very fast 
with the midterm. Sorry, this is midterm. Okay. Um, I just have to alert you that I really have a lot of slides, and if and it will be, I will try to really go very fast. But also, I had to be respectful of the work which this large team produced, and we produced a lot. But these are basically three large projects. They could be, you know, standing on their own. And, and, uh, and all of them received the respect and the detailed attention and all the feedback from you, so we really need to bear through. You can see here the main spine of the light rail, and also uh, it spans uh, all the way from uh, McDowell uh, to uh, Thomas Road and all the way to the north to uh, Indian School uh, Road. Um, what we usually do, we, the first days we do a tour. Uh, we do a tour with the local, uh, with the local representatives, with uh, everybody who wants to, to help us. You know, the neighborhood services representatives were great because they knew the issues, they knew everything, they knew every single historic building, so they gave us great tours in the beginning. We also met with uh, Will Bruder, who is another asset. Oh, I forgot this asset. You know, the asset for Mita, he's uh, a, a local artist. Architect, we know him very well. He gave us like a, a, a personal tour in the beginning, so we we learned a lot about the history uh, of Midtown and also the other the other areas. <clears throat> so what we usually do is we uh, try to identify to identify the neighborhoods or which are uh, which are centered along the line right, right actually. They were already identified. You know, we have historic neighborhoods, and in some cases, in places where there is not a very visible structure, we try to identify elements which can be enhanced for such uh, for, for such structures. And uh, well, it is very difficult for me to read them from here, which we, we actually try to to do that. But if we start from probably a, a very one of the most important elements is uh, Park, uh, Park uh, Central. And this is the mall, which is uh, a few blocks from here. We are right here on Osborne and Central, and this is Park Central, which is uh, the terminated uh, vista of Earl Road. This is a, um, uh, a mall which is uh, uh, struggling, has been struggling for a while, and we are proposing a really a renovation and uh, an urban, a new urban center. I'll go in much more detail later. Right across from it, uh, it is another neighborhood, and it is really very difficult to read, but um, Lexington, yes, Lexington. And uh, we discovered that right around uh, Earl and Third, there is the possibility of a, of a neighborhood node. Uh, these circles actually represent a pedestrian shed, a five minute walk from center to edge. Uh, so the center uh, actually represents a gathering either of public space or some sort of daily needs, services and daily needs for neighborhood use. So that's why we call them neighborhood nodes. Then the one below, its identity is actually defined by the two schools, the high school, St. Mary's and Monterey, the elementary school. So we were thinking that something in this area will be of great value. The neighborhood to the, to the south is really absolutely connected to the museums and to the, uh, uh, already to the cultural institutions which are right there. The two historic uh, neighborhoods uh, on the west side, on the west side of uh, uh, Central Avenue, uh, South Willow and North Willow. And then to the north, we discovered that this is a kind of a uh, the Yapi Center uh, with around the Clarendon. We went to the to the great uh, to the great Mexican restaurant, and we were the only ones, actually the older uh, ones of us. Uh, we uh, we were the only ones looking with our iPhones into the menu with the flashlight. Everybody else could see, but we could. So we knew. So we knew that this is the young crowd, the young crowd place. And we looked around. Yes, this was the case. So this. This is a kind of a nice uh, uh, identity which is already shaping up. It's across from the nursing school. And then on the other side is a neighborhood of great diversity of housing. Whether it's workforce housing or, you know, we call it uh, mixed income housing. There is like better, you know, better housing stock and then some which need some TLC. But there, there's a nice, pleasant variety and diversity. Uh, so, this is 
the proposed uh, master plan. As you can see, with the darker colors, you can see these little dots, and this is probably difficult for you to see, but there is a kind of a consistent infill intention along the uh, most important uh, spine of the light rail, and it veers off into the neighborhood centers, which are around, mainly around 3rd Street and around uh, 3rd Avenue. Uh, <coughs> We had a very nice, uh, nice discussions with Will Bruder and with the larger uh, community, the larger architectural community here in town. And this is idea, an idea which actually we would like to take, you know, credit for. But it was Will Bruder's idea. It's about a secondary transit loop which uh, goes around, uh, starts at Thomas and then goes. Uh, north on 3rd Street and then on Indian um, uh, School uh, and then down south on 3rd Avenue. The, the idea is that this is a secondary pedestrian environment enhancer. You know, it is uh, not necessarily like large, uh, uh, you know, many people mover, like what the light rail is, but it is an enhancement of the pedestrian environment. We have seen these uh, uh, around the country being built everywhere, uh, streetcars and also trolley buses. We are exploring now the idea, you know, the, the, the idea is that it's a fixed infrastructure. The streetcar is a little bit more expensive, but the private sector actually loves it because it is right there and there is a commitment for a betterment of the physical environment. So it's a kind of a great generator of new businesses, new buildings, a great environment. And it will be a, a very well intersecting uh, the light rail. Trolley buses, electric trolley bus with overhead wires is another option which is slightly cheaper. We're still looking at uh, comparisons. Uh, it is also fixed because, it, uh, because of the overhead wires and it's more quiet, it stops, both of them stop very often. Here these big yellow dots are very frequent stops. They're like one or two blocks, so basically it's, you can hop on and off. And these are, uh, these are transit enhancement elements which have been adopted all around the country. You know that in Tempe maybe a streetcar may be coming, and uh, uh, all around, you know, these this are like a big dream. In the past, actually, they were supported by the private development. So here we're looking at options not to load everything on the city or even going, you know, above the city. No. <laughs> no, that's not a, a good idea. And we know that the city right now has difficulties. So it will be a public-private partnerships. We're talking about uh, eco-districts, which will facilitate in some manner uh, the uh, bundling of different uh, of, the, of the financing of the different utilities and this may be uh, coming as a part of this uh, eco district so we're working on the details uh, but this is like one great idea then the rest these green uh, these green dots which you see it's a very dense network of proposed uh, bike lanes some of them are existing and some of them are proposed we just put them in the same color so you can see that this is a big goal uh, for the plan Park Central, as I promise I'll back, go back. First regional mall in 1956. It was a big thing when it first opened. Actually, it attracted a lot of a lot of businesses and a lot of residential development to come when the Park Central opened with the first uh, open uh, open air promenade in uh, in Phoenix and probably now in all of Arizona. Uh, and today it is uh, a more uh, a kind of an old vintage. Uh, probably many of you have heard that around the country there is already a movement to retrofit and to take care of these large properties, which are the malls, which are kind of in a, not a great shape these days. Uh, out of uh, 1,100 enclosed malls, about 30% are either dead or dying. So the ones who are forward thinking and not even in a bad shape today, they're already looking at proactively doing something, you know. And the, the good news is that they're the great depositories of real estate, empty parking lots where you can infill with higher density, with parking garages, with retail, with whatever you want, with local businesses, with fancy businesses, with uh, residential, with office, with lodging, hotels, everything. It is basically a great basket for mixed use development, urban center type. Uh, uh, thing which is in the heart of your midtown. You know, it used to be on the periphery, it used to be in the, in, in sprawl or in the, in, in the suburbs, but today it's in the heart of the community and needs to be something different. And you can see here the main gestures of a large park with an amphitheater. 
this uh, curvature here is already in along Third Avenue, so it's like it's uh, designed itself. You can see it right here. Uh, the, uh, there is a stage terminating the vista, of the uh, northeast uh, connector, the open promenade. Uh, it is the continuation of Earl, which is our neighborhood connector to the neighborhood uh, to the Earl uh, uh, neighborhood node. You can see that we broke, we deconstructed them all. We've created many more pedestrian connections. If you know uh, uh, the, the tradition of patio or courtyard uh, buildings, uh, we have some examples in Florida, in, uh, uh, in Palm Beach, but this is something which can be very easily incorporated uh, here, uh, also in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, and uh, uh, here, around it, uh, to shape this, uh, this wonderful oval, uh, or uh, common space, uh, we propose infill buildings. And they can be uh, anything from educational learning facilities or, uh, or businesses which are related to health. We have here the great institution of the Dignity Health of St. Joseph uh, Hospital Medical Center. I believe that they are already using some of the spaces as their offices, so these are upgraded offices. You can see infill with garages and then uh, all the edges and inside are lined with new construction. We're proposing a grocery store of some sort. It can be a, a small urban grocery store on Central Avenue. We heard loud and clear that people need one. We had a retail consultant, Bob Gibbs, who gave a very interesting presentation, and he said, you don't have yet the rooftops for such a grocery store right there. However, he said, with all the other synergies which he sees, it may be something which with a special, you know, with, with somebody special, it can happen sooner rather than, than later. A plaza terminating Earl. So everything is integrated in a pedestrian, walkable, good environment where you can imagine that, you know, a kid can go around or a person who is uh, at an older age or somebody with a bike, one of these yuppies uh, around the clarity. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the hipsters. Yeah, yeah. Well, I heard that it, they were a kind of a mixture, you know, hipsters and uh, yuppies. So I'm a kind of lost exactly where the subtle differences are. <laughs> I guess it's like the the different generations. Uh, so this is Park Central existing, the existing conditions, and then the the infill, which is uh, you can see that all of a sudden the fabric lo looks much more completed. We're talking about these places as uh, yes neighborhoods and, and, and great places, but they're somewhat incomplete, you know, as uh, Park Central is. So the goal is that we complete it. This probably is a stage where it's not very intense. We didn't put, you know, tall buildings, but actually uh, in our regulatory document we allow for higher intensity. And it was identified as one of the regional urban centers in the city general plan. So uh, we may have to draw another one where we intensify it even more so it becomes much more attractive for private uh, investment. Uh, okay, uh, this is a kind of a zoom in just to show the plaza. It, it, this is Earl terminating on the current uh, uh, clock tower, but a little bit enhanced. And then this is the grocery store. You can see a lot of uh, sustainability features as, uh, uh, as uh, solar panels. And then the green here terminating the, uh, this, uh, this uh, vista. Uh, we discussed with our retail consultant whether it will be a good idea to maybe cluster some local businesses in these places. And yes, he said that it's possible. This can be actually one of the anchor, you know, local businesses uh, whether they're arts or uh, what you know something else related or health related this is a, a great place to be together with other uh, with other uh, uh, anchors you know he didn't shy away from some of the nationals you know it's a kind of the mixture between national and local uh, to capture a kind of the more regional importance along central these are more technical drawings showing central avenue that's an important uh, uh, but nevertheless very important drawings uh, this shows that the idea of, uh, of um, creating one of the, taking one of the lanes, right now you have two lanes on Central, and making it a Shero. A Shero is basically a shared lane between vehicles and, uh, and bicycles. And the only difference today, now people share it. We saw them all the time, we, most of, you know, my young team, they were biking right there. Uh, what the difference is that basically the lane is painted really bright, so it's like an alert. See, this is where you have an alert to the driver that they have to really behave nicely, civilized to the to the bikers. Uh, Earl and Third Neighborhood 
node, I talked about this node, uh, it terminates uh, on the other side is Park Central and here it's, uh, it's uh, this node. This is the Signa building which was recently built, unfortunately to very suburban standards, a building in the middle of parking lot. It was just a lost opportunity, but we took it as a potential also for the, uh, you know, for the property owners or the, uh, the operators that they can actually use this opportunity and build some buildings on their edges and create a nice, uh, a nice focal point. Uh, there is a, a, a fairly large assemblage of uh, properties, which is maybe coming uh, sooner or later. Uh, Mixed-use infill uh, development with a hotel, which we believe is a great opportunity on the north uh, east corner with a plaza. This is the hotel, a garage, some mixed-use development, and then feathering down uh, to lower densities uh, towards the neighborhood. <laughs> On this uh, corner, a pop-up cafe and then a plaza, and I can show you the three-dimensional drawing. This is uh, Earl and Third neighborhood uh, looking south today, and then this is how it can be uh, in the future. The liners along Signa, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the possibility for the streetcar, the biking, the walking, the shade, all of these elements which make a better pedestrian environment. The uh, kind of uh, 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 not very uh, pedestrian friendly wall along uh, East to Earl, where we are thinking that a pop-up cafe as your, as your uh, Starbucks on the corner 7th uh, can be. Um, some more, uh, this is an important street section again because it shows the streetcar or the streetcar or the trolley bus in the middle of 3rd third, of third Street. It actually uh, can share a vehicle, vehicular traffic can be shared with the streetcar, which is the big difference from the light rail. It's a much more agile uh, form and not to even mention the trolley buses, they're, they're even more flexible. And this is, uh, this is a sequence of how 3rd Street can look. This is 3rd Street looking north, and you probably recognize businesses. Uh, this is the Zikis. Uh, they have been around for many years. Uh, you can start with painting with very small interventions, uh, painting uh, kind of a uh, protective lane for the bicyclists, and then go more ambitious with uh, planting some trees, putting some benches, benches uh, then a second row of, row of tree on the protective lane, parallel parking, uh, then uh, you know putting the streetcar or the trolley bus, then the buildings come in, benches, and then actually the pedestrians show up. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, yes. And I mean, they show up when things are, are good. You know, even now people walk around. So imagine when, when the environment becomes much more uh, pedestrian friendly. So we are uh, rushing through uptown. How is my timing? Probably horrible, but well, not so bad. You have a couple of more hours, we'll be done. <laughs> so this is, the <laughs> this is the existing conditions in uh, uptown. Uh, our uh, areas were, uh, you know, separated by uh, by district, you know, Midtown, Uptown, but they were they're very integrated. Many of the tools which were, we are using in Midtown and Uptown and Solano, they are basically very integral. Uh, so if uh, you think that we miss something in one of the districts, we can always uh, implement it in, in the other. Uh, so Uptown actually starts from Indian School uh, um, uh, Road all the way to Missouri Avenue to the north. It is intersected. Uh, north-south by, by uh, Central Avenue with the light rail and then to the west on Camelback again with the light rail. Um, and this is, uh, this is the discover, the, not the discovery, but the identification or the identity of the neighborhoods which, uh, which uh, constitute uh, Uptown. Uh, and you know them probably better than me. Oh, these are nicer, bigger letters. Carnation and uh, Pearson Place, uh, beautiful names, and St. Francis, um, and Windsor Square here, and then um, the Medlock Place, Pasadena, and Grandview. So they, uh, they form the clusters or the, um, um, the clusters of neighborhoods uh, around. And of course, here we have the still Indian Park uh, uh, site uh, with, the, with the two, uh, uh, the public school here and, uh, and Profi on the other. The, uh, and on the edge, uh, we have the VA hospital. So these are kind of the, the landmarks. Of course, I'm missing a lot, but uh, you can see them in more detail uh, later on the boards, by the way. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is the proposed condition, uh, the proposed master plan. You can see in darker uh, color. Oh, why is this so? Yeah. 
Ah, okay. It takes a little bit, yes, probably it's a larger file. Um, you can see in a brownish color all the infill which we are proposing here around Central Avenue, uh, around the canal and the intersection uh, with uh, Central, and then the famous corner here, the Camelback and Central, and along Camelback. So these are kind of the main interventions uh, along the transit-oriented corridor. Uh, these are the bike lanes, the proposed, uh, uh, the proposed and overlaid with the existing bike lane. So it's basically every, uh, every quarter mile you have these bike lanes. And of course, the, the other streets, which are local, small streets, of course people go there. They don't even need to have a designated uh, bike lane. They share with, uh, with other mobility. Uh, still Indian School Park. This is probably a kind of the, the highlight of this, uh, uh, one of the highlights of this, uh, of, of Uptown. Uh, we know that it's, uh, there, 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 have, there have been some controversies on the northeast uh, corner. Uh, but we are, are always taking a kind of a look at the bigger picture. We are not looking at the, uh, the obstacles today. We know that many people will be dead, you know, in a, you know, a decade or two decades or three decades. I mean, this is a kind of the most cynical way to put it, but planning is a long-term planning. And you know, there are generations, and these, <laughs> these hipsters and, and yuppies, they're coming, so they will demand different type of attitude to urban planning. So, you know, some of the obstacles may go away, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, new ideas may come along. Uh, so, uh, here we're looking at brand new edges, really a kind of the grand around your great central park. I mean, this is such an amenity which you have. This is a beautiful park, which somehow is buried in, in, in not so nice edges. You have parking lots here with a hospital. Uh, here you have, uh, yes, this is a kind of an empty land with a lot of, uh, right now there is a lot of stuff happening, uh, agriculture and all of that, but this is not an urban place. We kept, we kept some of the agriculture, urban agriculture, but we developed the corners. We just, we're showing how a good development, what good development can happen. And it is all about the vista towards your historic building, the Indian school building, the vista towards the peak, which I cannot pronounce. Um, yes, 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 and um, uh, and you can see here that there is a lot of infill with residential or whatever office buildings, which can be part of the expansion of the VA hospital. We had a great meeting with the Baptist, uh, with the uh, with the. Uh, Bethany Home Baptist Hospital in Solano. So we hope that we can actually involve also the VA hospital in, uh, within, with their uh, ideas for future expansion. And maybe they can uh, capture some of these ideas which we already have. Here we're proposing a continuous um, a driveway, which will be a, the great parkway. People can go to picnics, people can bike. One of these uh, parkways which are around the great parks around the country. And then you, you, you can see here uh, mixed use development. Uh, and then here, this is the unpronounceable <laughs> term. <laughs> and then it's uh, the terminated vista, some of the amenities, the wonderful bridges. There was a recent landscape uh, endeavor, a wonderful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, streetscape. And here the uptown district, how actually how uh, you cannot, uh, the, uh, the, this is the high school on the other side of the uh, of Brophy on the other side of the canal. And here this kid was about to jump the fence to go to the park. So all of these artificial boundaries we have to handle them in a different way. Either to put buildings which are uh, showing a habitable edge, which is uh, naturally supervised, uh, or uh, decide uh, that uh, you know jumping the fence is a good thing, which I believe uh, nobody will. And then still Indian School Park and, uh, and the corner, this is the existing condition. You can see that it's really underused and it's a very central, very uh, major and important intersection and how it can look with the uh, uh, entry plaza on the center, the great vista. I mean, how many people, how many cities in the country can brag with a vista like that, which will terminate their mountain? I mean, I just, I don't know that many. So this is an uh, unbelievable coincidence that you can actually, that you, this piece is not developed today, and you still have the opportunity for such a great amenity, which can be 
also uh, you know uh, uh, private sector very successful investment endeavor everybody wins your city will have all the elements which are needed to be a great place uh, to be you know all the assets which you were talking was talking about and all the things which we have been seeing like these long lists like laundry lists of desires and what we need uh, long and long and long but one thing when you go to a place and you want to stay there and walk a block after block after block after block of great stuff and you're never tired you know there are places around around the country and around the world and people pay money for to go on vacation then you know that some urban planning efforts have succeeded so we, we hope that we can create this even not continuous fabric of fabulousness but it will be nodes of urbanity where people can spend you know more than five minutes walking and this is a kind of the zoom in with the park. This is a, a, a memory of the uh, of, uh, of the central element in the park, but in a more urban, uh, in a more urban fashion. And um, oops, I, okay, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> but Matt can fix it from afar. Um, and you can see that the other corner is uh, proposed for something more intense. We're envisioning actually a second uh, grocery store, not second, but one of the locations for a grocery store was envisioned here. Then uh, Bob Gibbs, our retail consultant, a little bit cooled off our ambitions, but not in the long run. Remember, you know what happens in 24 years. Actually, here in this country, what what we just read in the news is that in 20 years we will have guess what 100 million more people or close 90 90 million more can you imagine so even if everybody is still alive you know there will be change of some sort <laughs> Grand Avenue, this is a super important element. We had a bunch of meetings with uh, on the canals. We talked about Canalscape. We have started this discussion all the way from Gateway, uh, the Grand Canal, and how you have all this, uh, another asset. You have so many assets that I always forget one of them. And your canals are one of these great assets, which actually it's very tough to know because you never see. You know, you have to fly over the city to see how they glisten in the sun. They're just amazing. And to know actually some facts that you have more canals than Amsterdam and Venice put together. I mean, it's just amazing. Amazing, and it's hidden in your backyard. And it's similar to what we have in Miami, so I know what, what's going on. So, but at the intersections and along the canals, you have the possibility to really celebrate, celebrate this great amenity. Not only as a, a, a conveyor of water, because we all depend on the water and we have to really be very respectful to the SRP, the Salt River Project, uh, servicing and all their, all of their, uh, the things which they do there, uh, you know, maintaining the canal and cleaning it and, uh, and protecting it, but also to turn our, to turn our faces, to change the relationship of the buildings to the canal, just to make something really outstanding. And we're showing this in several sectors along the Grand Canal within the, within the uptown district. Uh, and here you see uh, some new buildings. These are uh, probably up for redevelopment on the southern on the southern uh, bank. It is a, it's a kind of good uh, development still in good good housing stock. Uh, usually the uh, the pathway which is the service pathway for SRP is on the south side. So the opportunities for uh, bikeways and uh, for bikeways and pedestrian uh, and pedestrian pathways and pedestrian activities uh, we were recommended by the SRP to have one more on the northern on the northern edge this doesn't mean that redevelopment will not happen on the southern in terms of real estate uh, development and this is uh, the existing conditions today the aerial and this is the proposed you can see it here on the on the northern side, actually, Chris Reader was very inspired, and he went into uh, into a lot of detail with this uh, drawing. You can see here on the corner uh, a building which is uh, uh, nicely embracing uh, Central Avenue, and then continues uh, as an L shape along the canal. Uh, we are proposing uh, a, a covered walkway, which will be also a piece of art. 
These are special elements which are called uh, protective uh, shading devices. And this is uh, basically painting on the ground, a painting showing the water. You know, so you're reminded that the water is running underneath and will kind of alert you that you are, that you can actually look left and right, of course, and drive safely, but you can. Uh, <laughs> But for the pedestrians, for the pedestrians specifically, this is a great uh, signature. It becomes like a gateway. There will be also a hawk. Uh, we had our engineers work very hard with the city engineers, with the street department, with uh, everybody uh, involved in us. Many meetings. We had many meetings on the intersections that they're made the most, uh, the most uh, safe. Um, and then uh, here, a little bit more detail. Maybe this shading device is connected to the to the galleries or the shading, uh, the shading structures around the building. Then a beautiful, a beautiful sculpture garden, and then terminating on a cafe. So it's like a perfect public space, which which uh, signifies this entryway to the to the canal and to uh, to this uh, to this amazing place. Then uh, Chris had this uh, great idea. You know, we were talking about oh maybe we can have some kind of an outlook on the water uh, of some sort. And he had the idea that it's like movable. You know, whenever there is the servicing of the canal, you can move this little uh, viewing uh, structure back back on, on little rail. So he's, he's very inventive in this regard. And then you can see here the development. Um, we had our Nan Allen on our uh, consulting team. She, she is a former professor at ASU. She is now doing great things in Utah. But she was uh, among the supporters of, of the great uh, project and ambitious uh, ideas which you had with the so-called canalscape. And she wanted and she reminded us several times that uh, actually the development, the real estate development, oh, sorry, the real de uh, estate development along the, uh, okay, so it's a little stuck now. Uh, the real estate development along the canal is called, it, you can, you, you have to refer to it as a canal oriented development. This is uh, the real estate or the, the private, uh, the private, uh, uh, sector uh, possibility of doing something really great around the canal. And then if we deal with the uh, landscape and streetscape, the pathways and maybe in some way incorporating uh, the, the uh, service, the service uh, uh, pathways which the SRP has, these are canal uh, canalscape enhancements. So uh, these are the two elements which actually can go together or they can go uh, one after the next. And here, this is I wanted to uh, to show the very inspired element of uh, this uh, shading device and in the shape of a bird. And what Chris did, he made it out of paper and, and, and created this this uh, this element, which looks actually we were. Uh, joking that it looks like a hawk and you're going to have a hawk there, but it looks also like a phoenix. So it will be up to you whether it's a hawk or a phoenix rising. So that's the bird. And actually he reminded me, he had another drawing, but I didn't include it. I think I didn't include it, which was basically uh, that this is made uh, out of one piece of material, whether I think it's some kind of metal, uh, and it's no material is wasted. So it's really cool. So that's a great thing for some local business to grab this idea and create a business for a shading devices and public art engagement along the canal intersections. Here, here you go, adaptive, some kind of, uh, in one of these adaptive reuse buildings. Canal-oriented development, as I said, actually can happen first and foremost, before even some of the enhancements along the canal, streetscape enhancements happen. Uh, this is another uh, another site, a more typical location in the area of 7th Street. There were some buildings which uh, burned down. There were some, uh, some incidents. So you can begin actually with an infill of buildings on both edges and gradually and gradually think about enhancement and uh, the streetscape which comes later. And this is a bikeway. You, you can see that the trees, we try to stay away with the trees within the 20 uh, feet uh, SRP easement. They have 20 feet, so we respected that. And maybe some plants will be good for, I don't know, for the retaining of the soil or something. So we added that too. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that uh, the things happen. You know, there is a coffee shop here, and this can be a kind of a typical, a typical uh, condition along the canal. Oh well, we we put some trees even, even here. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we're grateful to the 
SRP and Jim Duncan, who came to many of our meetings, that he's very open to ideas and, uh, and we're working together on, uh, on good solutions. And we have to say we went to Scottsdale <laughs> to criticize the project. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So this is Central and Camelback, another important in intersection, and we have heard um, legends about this intersection. But again, we stepped back, you know, we heard all complaints, all issues, all things, it just everybody wants something different, which doesn't fit with the neighbor for some reason. And they, there is a residential, wonderful neighborhood here, the Windsor neighborhood. There is a shopping center with uh, good intentions to be renovated in the future. Uh, there is a, a big development uh, coming here, another potential for redevelopment here. This is an office building which is waiting to be adaptive, reused, or something to be done with it. There are many commotions uh, along Camelback, we heard. I mean, there are really a lot of things happening at this intersection. Again, we try to step back and say, what if? What will happen if we create something like, again, another signature? So you're going to have not only one place with the Indian school, you know, the option for your uh, postcard, but you're going to have another one. And you maybe, all of a sudden, you have diagonals. <laughs> this is yet another diagonal, which was uh, inspired by other uh, TOD developments around the country, which the geometry of the Windsor neighborhood in the back reminded, uh, reminded us of. There is a, a, a project which was done in the beginning of the last century called Forest Hills. It's in Queens in New York and it's on the rail. And it's this incredible arch with mixed use building and then you enter into a wonderful single family housing, all leafy and all of that, very similar to Windsor. So we were thinking that maybe with a better design, with a better interface between the neighborhood and the edges of a more intense or more mixed use development on the corner, we can actually satisfy all interests in some way. You can see here on the edges right now, the houses, these houses here, which are on one of these uh, 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 winding streets, the houses are facing uh, the service, uh, the services, the service area of the part of the, of the uh, shopping center and also to the north. What we are doing here, we are taking a piece and we are creating lots for single family houses. So single family houses face single family houses. And on, on the northern edge, townhouses facing sing, single family houses. So it's a, a kind of a very similar type, building type, facing each other instead of, you know, uh, uses which are a little bit further away, you know, kind of uh, the back of, a, of a, a commercial building fronting a residential neighborhood. So this, uh, this diagonal uh, is uh, a pedestrian from here on, termina on terminated on, the small, on a small building. Uh, there may be some uh, park structured parking here uh, to accommodate a mixed-use development on the corner with a great, uh, uh, again, oval plaza in the middle. So again, it's like diagonals and ovals. We have the oval in Park Central, so there is like a repeated, <coughs> a repeated uh, theme. Uh, here some renovations along Central Avenue and also along Camelback, uh, certain, certain ideas about better transitions to the residential neighborhoods in the back. It is a sketch which uh, Mike Houston did uh, uh, very fast for our meeting which we had on uh, Wednesday, I believe, in the evening, which was uh, neighborhood compatibility and uh, and transitions meeting, it was called, I mean, this was like, we have never had a meeting with this title, such a specific neighborhood transitions and adapt, uh, and uh, uh, whatever else it was. <laughs> the transitions were the, the very important element. So uh, we discussed with many of you uh, how to interface the very intense development which is expected along, uh, along Central Avenue and the historic, uh, uh, more quiet and more uh, residentially centered neighborhoods in the backs. And we came up with a few uh, interesting ideas uh, like transitional building types which are stepping back uh, towards the back, uh, towards the smaller buildings uh, in the neighborhoods. Uh, 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 like for example, oh. <laughs> like in this, uh, in this case, as you can see, there is an alley. There is an alley here. Uh, behind the first block on Camelback uh, with some houses, uh, the yards of some houses, and here we make a very, uh, a kind of very smooth transition uh, towards them. 
uh, with, uh, with, within the alley. Uh, we call these units muse units, which can be habitable space, or they can be uh, small units with uh, where you park and where you have your workshop, or maybe even some living. You put the teenager, the loud teenager there, or your mother-in-law, or something like that. But it's, they're very tiny. But they're actually eyes on the on the alley, you know. To make these alleys um, uh, more safe, this is a good a good way to go to, to have some habitability. And you can see here the buildings are uh, three, four the stories, maybe five in some instances here, are along the corners where it makes makes sense. Uh, whatever also can be accommodated with uh, with parking. You know, parking usually is the determiner. Uh, 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 of course, now with our regulatory mechanisms and codes, we are, will be reducing the parking requirements because people will be using more and more the light rail. And there were some great statistics which were shared by us at the opening presentation by Alan that showing that actually you have uh, already outpaced the expectations like for many years ahead. I, I don't remember even for 2020 or something. Which means that many people already uh, use the light rail and bike and walk more than it was expected. Uh, and then this is the building which is on the other corner, on this corner, see this building here? Our great uh, hosts uh, from uh, Shipley and Bullfinch, they were also inspired and they did an adaptive reuse of this building, which is an office building, and they envisioned it as a, uh, as a residential building with some green elements, with green walls, with maybe a bridge uh, to, to the uh, property next door. And these are different sketches. They were very inspired and sent us a bunch of things, but we had only one slide for them. <laughs> but we're thankful for their participation. <laughs> I also have to say before, because I think it's towards the end and maybe um, we may not even uh, go there, uh, that we had uh, in the middle of, uh, no, in the beginning of this week actually, 24 architects uh, which, are, uh, which were organized by the local AIA. Uh, and Mr. Bruder, he was a kind of the uh, flag uh, <laughs> carrier, uh, and he uh, and basically we had a great workshop testing the code. You know, the code is the regulatory mechanism which for the, the will make these things to happen in the future. Of course, if you like them, if you don't like them, they're you are not going to uh, uh, to approve the code, and they're not going to happen. But if you are supportive, if we have a consensus of the community, of the neighborhoods and stakeholders, private sector and public sector, then this document will be approved and many of these things can become reality. 7th uh, Avenue and Camelback, uh, we heard that this is a nice uh, place for redevelopment, a shopping center retrofit. I wrote a book called The Sprawl Repair Manual, so when I see an empty lot with a, with a strip shopping center which is not doing that well, actually I see an opportunity. I, I don't see it as something which is a lost cause, especially when it's surrounded by urbanism, by residential neighborhoods, by people who expect something better. So it's a great potential for a small, uh, lesser of less intensity urban center with a small green, with a diagonal to a larger green. Uh, LA, the LA uh, fitness is still doing great with a great pool. Some people from our uh, team use it, so they said, keep it, keep it for now. But it can be actually, <laughs> it can be renovated or it can be built up. I mean, there are many uh, things we can do with this building, maybe uh, uh, lining it at the front. And then uh, some of the other big boxes can be repurposed, uh, repurposed in uh, uh, either uh, artist residences, uh, but a courtyard retrofit of any kind. It's, uh, there are many, many ideas of what uh, can come there. And of course, mixed use uh, infill in these uh, more dense blocks. And there are some other notes. Uh, this is the uh, LRT uh, station, which is here, I guess. Is there a station here? I don't see it. I guess there is. It's not shown. We have a special way of showing it. And then these are the liner buildings, which uh, currently will will be. Uh, I mean, these are right now. This is the LRT here, uh, which is not uh, very highly used, and we're proposing a thin uh, liner buildings. And we have some drawings of them. I don't think that we included them as a building type. Uh, Indian School Road, uh, this is an important, uh, an important road, uh, which is uh, basically what we are looking at is a, uh, uh, from uh, right now it's the existing configuration is four and then the middle, the middle section four, one and three, and by making it uh, three, one and two, we are creating the possibility 
uh, for uh, the possibility for biking lane, also for shared lane for this future for this future um, stretch. Uh, of the streetcar or the trolley bus, which I mentioned. This is a little bit out of order, but these are some technical drawings. And then Camelback again, which is uh, North 3rd Street and North 7th Avenue, right, uh, which is uh, showing how uh, by taking a couple of lanes, you can create uh, a double cycle uh, lanes, double, uh, double lanes for cycling, and also parallel parking on the north side. So this is a little bit a more radical solution with asymmetrical uh, street section, but it's probably anything will be better than the current situation. Highland Avenue, a street section uh, of a local, local street, uh, uh, as you can see, it's not very big, it's a small right-of-way, but it's basically cars uh, and uh, uh, there is currently, I guess, parallel parking. But what we would like to do is to introduce uh, these uh, green uh, interrupted, the so-called uh, interrupted planters, where stormwater can be handled but also can create a more protected environment. Uh, for the smaller street when there is not too much of a sidewalk to, to put continuous uh, planters. And then we are racing uh, through Solano. Uh, this is our northern edge. Uh, this is a neighborhood and a district of great uh, capacity as well. Uh, here we, just to orient you, on the, uh, on the southern edge we have uh, Campbell Avenue. We have Camelback Road here with the station on 19th and Camelback right here. We heard a lot of things about this intersection, that it's dangerous for crossings, it's, uh, uh, there, is, that there are other activities there, that it's, it's just not a great, a great place. So we, uh, we paid specific inten uh, uh, attention to this place. Uh, again, great potential here. The name of the place is uh, after the great uh, Solano Park. It's a beautiful park with a street which deserves something more than just parking lots on one side facing the park. Uh, the great amenity of the, uh, of the Bethany Home Baptist Hospital, which is a great anchor on the northern edge. They're now going through the, uh, you know, the extension of the light rail, as you know, but it is uh, something which will make them uh, probably uh, stronger in the long run. Uh, people are already leaving. I saw you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> but they have been here, I think, before, so <laughs> but all right. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, uh, there are other other assets in this neighborhood which are which are with Park Lee. This is a recently renovated uh, renovated housing development. Uh, Westwood neighborhood uh, here anchored on one of the schools. South Simpson and North Simpson, we call them like this. They're not necessarily identified like this uh, by, by themselves. Then Christown, of course, and then uh, Nile, uh, Nile and then the, uh, the light rail. And, uh, and uh, the proposed, as you can see, uh, all the opportunities we took, all the opportunities where we could intensify and urbanize, uh, we took them. And uh, we intensified this intersection here uh, between uh, 19th and Camelback and the upper, uh, the upper corners on both sides of, on both sides of uh, Central Avenue creating uh, basically new urban nodes or urban cores uh, which will serve the larger and growing community around them. Um, and I will go in greater detail. Um, this is the network of uh, bike lanes existing and proposed. You can see again every quarter mile and of course all the local streets uh, as well. Some of them are existing and some of them are, uh, are, will be proposed, but we wanted to show you how, how dense this network uh, will be. Uh, I will start from the north and we'll be going south. Uh, Christian Spectrum Mall, which, is, uh, which was one of the, oops, again. Uh, which was again was one of the great uh, one of the great attractions uh, in the mid-century with uh, the grand interiors. 
I mean, these were the great uh, development uh, generators at some point, but this is a kind of old news today. The malls are, I don't think that there was another mall built since 19, 2006. There was not a single enclosed mall built in the country. This will tell you something. So these are these giants which are going away sooner or later. We know that currently the mall is doing uh, well with the big anchors of, of the uh, Walgreens, the, the uh, Target and the Costco. And these are uh, uh, great amenities for the neighborhood. However, uh, we again took it one step further and we basically <laughs> redeveloped all of their parking lots. We didn't take, we didn't take away the parking. Uh, we are showing uh, parking structures. When you have mixed use and more intense development, structure parking becomes uh, feasible. So we are showing that. Uh, we are showing a kind of a new uh, attitude towards uh, the edges uh, of the residential neighborhoods to the north and to the west. Uh, residential of smaller scale, maybe townhouses facing uh, the east neighborhood to the east. I'm sorry, to the east, and then to the north, uh, uh, maybe uh, some apartments uh, and other development, and maybe a mix of businesses, uh, offices along along the edge. Uh, we have been uh, dealing with certain developments, very similar development, one in Utah, uh, which reminds me about um, the fact that some of these anchors do not need uh, today uh, the great visibility because we don't have highways here anymore. We have a light trail, people walk, the, the speeds are different. And of course, Walmart and Target and, 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 and Costco, they don't need uh, a lot of visibility, their destinations. So everybody knows where they are. They're gonna find them. So they don't need exposure. You know, probably they will tell you differently, but uh, <laughs> but we have actually spoken to some, we have spoken to some of their national representatives, and this is the latest trend that these anchors can be embedded in urbanism. They are not opposed uh, opposed to this. And again, we're looking uh, we're looking uh, a long uh, kind of long range uh, redevelopment. Yeah, of course, it can start a small. And you can see here uh, a different edge on this beautiful street, which is, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but Montebello. Montebello, exactly. It's a beautiful residential with already the trees are there. So it's just you can build on one edge and then the park becomes something different. And we, with very small interventions, this is uh, currently it is the jewel of the neighborhood, but it can become a real diamond. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Solano School is on this edge. The neighborhood. This is uh, this is currently a library, but we are suggesting another library, which is closer to the light rail, right here on a plaza, if if a library is necessary. It's a kind of an idea which also came from uh, Mr. Bruder, and we we have to give him credit for that idea. Uh, this uh, luckily is uh, currently a park and ride which is not very used and it's owned by the city. Great redevelopment site and a wonderful opportunity actually to show what a model redevelopment project can be. The city will be probably uh, sending out an RFP uh, very soon. I don't know whether it was a secret or not, but that's here you go. <laughs> Here you go, but it's, it's an amazing opportunity. It is a flat, wonderful site of, I don't know how many acres, uh, uh, whatever, 15 acres or even more, but it creates the potential for a wonderful connection between the existing, some of the existing apartments, a pedestrian connection here, all the way to the park. So it's all about connectivity. One of your mantras was connectivity. Connectivity, connectivity, and you're absolutely right. For pedestrian uh, environment and bicycling, this is uh, one of the most important thing. If you have mega blocks and mega structures, then everything falls apart. Uh, urbanism falls apart, uh, the pedestrian, pedestrians are afraid, everything, basically nothing works. It, and we go back to suburbia. Everybody has to drive from one place to another. But if you have a fine grain of urban fabric, then everything works and supports each other. So you can see here the possibility for parking structures, uh, maybe a farmer's market on this corner, the entrance on Montebello, the new library. Then you go all the way up north to the great other, to the other corner on the northwest uh, with the with the hospital. We uh, we discuss with them their uh, uh, their uh, vision for the next uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, they just were really happy that we are involved in involving them very early in the process. 
uh, they didn't sign off, of course, on any of these drawings, but they said that, you know, they see a lot of potential for collaboration, and they're actually asking, so how are you going to extend this process? How are you going to implement? So they will be on the table discussing with the city and with the other partners on the other corners the possibility of really creating these true partnerships which we have been talking about, you know, for better infrastructure and for improvement of these, uh, of these neighborhoods. Uh, and this is the, I mean, this is, all of this is great, but it just doesn't belong here. You know, if it's like far away, far away in the suburbs, yes, or in sprawl, yes, but not here in the very uh, heart of your city. It used to be on the fringes, but not anymore. So you can, you, you can basically accommodate the one million uh, coming Americans. Uh, being, you know, for the next several decades. So, as you can see, the fabric is not uh, extremely intense. Uh, it is, you know, four or five stories. Uh, we haven't yet looked at the heights. We don't know exactly. I mean, actually, we have, and we have some drawings over there, uh, some regulating plans, which we are uh, now working with the city to match with some of the place types or the urban centers or uh, urban place types which they have identified and how to coordinate. Uh, so, but you can see here that with the four or five story fabric you can create wonders. I mean Paris, all of Paris, the best part of Paris is only six stories everywhere. You know, they're, now they're talking about high buildings and it's like a great commotion. Uh, so you can see here a plaza, whether it will be a uh, uh, just a civic place where people come or it can be used for, uh, for uh, markets. Uh, we are proposing here uh, some buildings which are related to, uh, related to urban agriculture. We heard this also in many neighborhoods, especially in this one, that it's probably uh, going to work with the residents that they will be interested in participating in community uh, gardening. Uh, and, uh, and then here, Another, another element which is interesting is about the transition between the, uh, between the more intense development and then the residential neighborhoods in the back. What we try to do is to create gateways which actually meet and celebrate the entrance to the neighborhood, to the residential neighborhood. Uh, it's not a gate which is closed and you cannot go through, but it's a gateway. It is something which is traffic count. It can be a monument, a roundabout, or a square about, or whatever you want. On the corner, maybe with a cafe, uh, we are redeveloping one layer of the buildings along Central, which are now single-family houses, but they are just ready for redevelopment. They're struggling, and they're not appropriate uses. Single-family on Central, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on 19th with the light rail. So we're proposing uh, the so-called flex building, which is uh, possibly uh, uh, some commercial uh, in a loft situation, maybe with some residential above, two or three uh, stories maximum to create a nice transition to the residential neighborhood in the back. And you see here, these are the urban blocks which we're talking about with green courtyards, with maybe some structured parking and four or five story uh, height of mixed, uh, of mixed use, which actually will respond to the upcoming market. We're not imposing what kind of use will go anywhere that's why we are creating a code which we call form-based code. We care about the form and the shape of the urbanism and the streets and the public realm, not so much about the building, about the building use in the, uh, in the buildings. Of course, we, we care about that. They have to be compatible and all of that, but we bundle them in, uh, in bigger groups. So you can have in one building, you can have offices and uh, all lodging, all residential, uh, depending on what the market um, the market offers or, or what the community needs. And this is Bethany Home Hospital. As I said, we're proposing infill uh, with some healing gardens, with some green space. Right now, they also have a lot of underutilized uh, parking lots and some uh, aging infrastructure which may be replaced. Uh, so they have a uh, place to expand uh, their services, whether they will be local neighborhood services, uh, physicians, or prophylactics, or um, uh, therapy, physiotherapists, or some other uh, uh, doctor's offices and things like that, uh, or just retail. It's, this is uh, also to be, uh, to be developed further. And at the back, some redevelopment uh, of residential, of the residential 
uh, elements which are currently here. Some of them can be renovated and retrofitted, some of them can be uh, replaced. Going further down into the Nile neighborhood, uh, Camel, Camelback and 19th, this neighborhood actually was shown in our study area as a place for, uh, with good potential for redevelopment. So we wanted to show a good showcase of mix of different, of different building types, how you can have larger, more commercial building types on the edges where the light rail is, uh, maybe with a larger out. Oh, this is actually an existing, very important anchor uh, where the uh, where the uh, mural will happen and maybe a public plaza at the front. And then how you can taper uh, in within the neighborhood, with the neighborhood center, uh, different building types. They can be small apartments, you know, six plexes, four plexes with uh, surface parking in the back, or they can be larger buildings uh, like these ones, some townhouses uh, like these, or live work units. So a kind of a full range of building types, a kind of a, a model project if all of this uh, comes for redevelopment. And then we uh, heard loud and clear that this is a neighborhood of great uh, ethnic diversity, uh, that uh, there are possibilities uh, to create a place where all of this diversity actually come together in one place and being celebrated. This is the park and ride facility, another city-owned property and a great opportunity for a model project right here. On the corner, uh, on the corner of, of uh, 19th and uh, Camelback, we are proposing a supermarket, then a smaller ethnic market next to it, uh, maybe with a parking garage to the south or a surface parking, uh, then some mixed-use retail buildings along Camelback uh, of higher intensity, maybe courtyards, uh, buildings which are a little bit set back from Camelback, and then in the middle to have community gardens. We heard that uh, all these diverse neighborhoods, uh, diverse uh, coming people coming from diverse places, actually this can be a nice, a nice uh, place for them to share some experiences, uh, maybe to share uh, experience in, uh, in agriculture, uh, a, a market, a special uh, ethnic uh, farmer's market with a community building and an amphitheater. Uh, the market can happen here on the edges, you know, the, tr the trucks just come in and park and uh, this can be done on the weekends or even greater if they are even uh, through the week. So, and then smaller buildings, uh, townhouses related to, to the uh, urban gardens in the back uh, face the single family housing. So it's also a neat uh, a kind of a project which can be uh, shown as a, um, uh, as, a, uh, as a model project. This is the existing conditions today, and Chris actually just didn't have uh, time to color, uh, to watercolor this whole thing. But by highlighting, by, by highlighting the, the green, the gardens in the in the middle, you can you can actually get the impression of what this drawing will be. In a week or, or so, we'll have the the watercolored version. Uh, but we wanted to make the case for the plaza on the corner. And then the green and the, uh, and the urban gardens uh, in the middle, which you can see that they have connectivity everywhere. We heard from this neighborhood that, you know, the, uh, they have nice neighborhoods, but they're not well connected to Camelback. So with the new community, with the new infill, we try to create as many uh, eyes on the street or habitable space along the, uh, along the uh, sidewalks uh, as possible. And, uh, oh, you can. I have something else on my, on my screen. Uh, so you can see here the larger footprint of the grocery store, uh, maybe with the ethnic grocery store on the ground floor. The, uh, you know, these gardens actually can uh, showcase their produce right there on the corner. So these urban gardens now are taking, are, are taking like they're on fire around the country. So we believe that here, because you have a lot of extra space, a lot of underutilized land, they can be a nice, uh, a nice addition uh, to your uh, streetscape and and, uh, and your neighborhoods. Uh, Camelback transformation. Uh, we know that Camelback is has been uh, has been. Uh, yeah, here a single uh, a walker along the street. Uh, we have heard loud and clear that we need improvements. Uh, we, uh, we need human scale and better uh, environment. And this is dreaming big. You can see what, what happened here. <laughs> yes. And uh, we have 
some steps in between, but we wanted to put here the shocker. <laughs> Not to do the, well, it will take too long. So you can see that with the buildings close, close by here, reducing the setbacks, which are right now you have suburban setbacks. Your codes now require suburban setbacks. When you pull the buildings close to the sidewalk, then you create a really safe environment for outdoor seating, you know, for, for shading, which will shade, you know, with basically with one element, you shade two things, the sidewalk and the building. You create a, a good environment with the trees. Parallel parking, which is very good for protecting uh, the the walkers on Camel on, here on on Central. Actually, the other day people were really speeding, and I was thinking, well, parallel parking will make so much sense. It will a pedestrian will feel so much better, and actually, it's great for it is great for pedestrian uh, for the businesses also to have a parallel parking. So this is uh, this transformation. Oh, walkable urban code, I'm, it's very close to the end, so don't worry. <laughs> there will be maybe just like five minutes. Uh, so walkable urban code, I touched upon it uh, a little bit. It is all about the form and the shape of the community. It's about community building, about place making, and not about separation of things, separation of uses, which was the prior, our prior thinking about coding and regulating, which was right here, you know, the little pods, residential, commercial, everything separate here. This is what we want to create, a mixed use and walkable environment. These are the results today from your zoning code, from the traditional zoning code. Uh, we have 264 zoning categories with 246 code amendments, and it has been just accumulating. It was just the thinking started in the early 20s of separation of uses with all the good, good intents, but then, you know, basically things were uh, went uh, really uh, badly. However, you have currently a, uh, a overlay, which is the TOD overlay, which is a one huge step, and you have also already a form-based code for the downtown. That's why we're skipping the downtown. You're already doing great things in downtown. So now we are expanding the form-based code. We are hoping that we'll build upon the good things which are already achieved with the uh, current TOD overlays and with the downtown code, and also to learn some lessons about making the process faster, cheaper, more effective, and do the next level. We'll have three documents, one which will be the code, then there will be some guidelines, you know the code is just the law, so it will be very dry, the lawyers will love it, but you know the general public, eh, not so much. So there will be guidelines explaining why things are like that, you know, only numbers and the, the, the dry numbers and parameters will be here, this will be the ex explanation, and then there will be a toolbox, Matt, this is your section, so you better <laughs> fix it. <laughs> And then there will be a toolbox which will be basically many tools which we have learned from uh, doing work around the world and around the country uh, and your own local great examples to do uh, to uh, uh, many tools which you, you can apply to the different transit zones or the different uh, uh, the different uh, uh, districts within along the light rail. So it's basically the code, its explanation, and some graphic details, these three documents. We hope that we do not complicate things further, but we can replace a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the larger documents uh, from the past. And it will be a process. It's not going to happen uh, instantaneously. Uh, it will be uh, probably a process of a few months to go through the details, to work with the technical committees. Uh, here, Matt and uh, our code team had many meetings. I don't know, some of them were secret in the city hall, so I didn't even go there. But, you know, they were basically uh, doing a lot of brainstorming about simplification and, and wordsmithing. You know, every word has to mean something. It cannot be just thrown out there and then we pull our hair out, you know, planners and architects and private developers and, uh, and lawyers what this means. So they were very careful about every, every word. And here this is the interface with the, with the place types which the city has already uh, voted in as a concept in the general plan. So we will be uh, building upon them. As I said, we are, have been working on transitions. Uh, with the neighborhoods, we are careful about that, you know, because the stepping up from a tall building to the little buildings, this will be the trick to create a really good environment uh, and not to raise uh, your passions. A walkable, <laughs> then ensure, uh, ensuring a walkable frontages. Uh, we are working on many building types, uh, on many uh, actually 
ways of the, how the buildings uh, meet the street, we're not looking so much at the building type. If somebody invents a building type, you know, they will be welcome, you know, but it's important that the building behaves in a way which is appropriate to where it belongs. We were in Jerome on our little tour on the weekend, and we love certain building types which are totally forgotten. You know, galleries and porches, and this stepping up to the second floor. I mean, things which are now we cannot do because they are illegal, illegal by our current standards. So we have to do a lot of gymnastics to basically allow some of these uh, great inventions from past times to actually co coexist with our uh, with our built environment today. So uh, all in this uh, in this uh, direction, in this spirit, our team went out and uh, actually did a lot of uh, deep uh, uh, study and analysis of the frontages and how to code them. Uh, some local architects, I don't remember the names, but they came and they brought us a lot of great photography and their local knowledge of what that means. Uh, and the frontage basically means where your front door is, what the setback is, how it's shaded, whether you have, you know, uh, uh, hidden like a massive solid wall, empty wall, or you have a lot of glazing and habitable space. I mean, things like this. And you have very inventive, some of your frontages are really inventive, like the clever koi and all the adaptive reuse buildings which we visited. So we need to actually incorporate. So we'll have to do a lot of, uh, uh, a, a little bit more thinking than usual. <laughs> Uh, and then these are the maps, we call them regulating maps, where the, the transect zones, which come together with the form-based code, uh, will be allocated. You saw the many sprinkled, you know, the 264 zoning categories in the current code. We are going down to how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, like seven? Are they seven? Seven or eight. We are trying to con consolidate all of this spot zoning which has been happening till now will be alleviated. It's now basically we will alleviate everybody's uh, you know, lengthy uh, working days, you know, from the bureaucrats to the lawyers to, the, to everybody. So it will be very clear, you know, what you have. If you want the vision which I just presented, it will be, you will know what you're going to get. And then your neighbor is not going to put a parking lot next to your, you are make all the efforts to put the building on the sidewalk and then your neighbor goes and does whatever they want and puts the building in the middle of the parking lot and then they, you know, they just don't comply with the overall vision. No, it's if we, uh, if we go together with this vision, then, then everybody will be uh, in the same boat working towards this, the, uh, towards, uh, this uh, final end. So these are the regulating plans for the three districts. And then I will end with the local architects. They tested the code and they did some sketches and we're very grateful to them that they, uh, uh, that they participated in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this exercise. And with that, I, will, I have two more things to say. One was that Actually, I was approached many times, and I was asked, and it was, I was just amazed because, like, it re, it was repeatedly, you know, I was repeatedly asked the same question. I'm like, oh, I have to answer this question <laughs> with a bigger audience. The question was, what is the big wow in your master plan? What is the big idea, or what is the silver bullet? And every time I was a little bit not prepared, but now I'm prepared. <laughs> Actually, it will be a plan of many, many ideas, of multiple ideas. This is a plan of multiple ideas and multiple participants. This is not a plan for just the big mega projects. It will be consisting of small projects, medium projects, and big projects, not only the big ones. It will be something which will cover the little tactical interventions like parklets and painting here and there and wanting your uh, space and your uh, neighborhood and your, your square to look better. Uh, it will include probably infill a smaller scale. It will include large buildings. It will include mall retrofit, you know, which is quite a grand uh, endeavor. It includes, it will include the full range, the full scale of urban planning. And this is how build, how the great places are built. This, these are the places where everybody wants to go on vacation. You know, it's not built neither by, from the top only, neither from the bottom only. It's when this synergy, uh, uh, which synergy is, is combined. And then the second thing I wanted to stress upon is that, yes, we're, you know, yeah, here it's now really nice. I, from your body language, I see that maybe you like some of these ideas. 
that these ideas will become reality if you have a great leadership. I can very easily say, oh yeah, all of you, you know, kumbaya, you all of you do it. But it's not that easy. You have to have leaders. And these leaders have to be from the city, they have to be your elected officials. They have to be your, they have to be your neighborhood uh, associations, na neighborhood uh, leaders. They have to be your business leaders. They have to be your generational leaders. You have to have leaders everywhere. From our experience, I have 20 years experience with uh, our company. Where I have been the most happy is when things happen. You know, you go 15 years after the project, these pretty pictures. 15 years later, well, I see them out, out of the ground, and it's like, wow. They have never happened without the people, on the, you know, without the leaders. Never happened. So I hope that you take this, you know, you choose, you pick your leaders, or you become one. You become a leader, and then we achieve all of this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. plans and pictures they've put up here today and going through this presentation. Uh, as she just said, this is just the start of a process and it doesn't get implemented without the leadership in the community and throughout the, the entire city of Phoenix to make this happen. One of the things that I want to stress and emphasize to you as the director of the department is that in this time of scarce resources, whether they're scarce resources from the city, from private investment, being able to make projects work uh, for um, environmental purposes, there are a lot of things that are causing scarcity, they're causing people to rethink the way things are done. And we need to, as a area, come together as a community of existing residents, property owners, new millennials who want to live in the area, developers, to come together around these plans as they get finalized through the rest of this year um, and then move towards adoption so that we can advocate for their implementation. Otherwise, if we don't come together as a group collectively, we're going to lose out not just to other cities and other states who want to see this style of development and have plans in place and have a, a collective body saying, yes, we're on the same page, we want this. They'll go to other cities in, in this, this region, in Tempe and Mesa. Uh, you know, development dollars will go out to other cities like 16th Street. Right now there are four or five multifamily projects that are proposed along 16th Street from the, the Northern Avenue corridor going down south. Those projects really ought to be looking more towards downtown, towards the light rail line to make some of those things happen. Collectively, we can work together to try and make some of those things happen, but it comes together with all of you sitting in this room here today working together to make that happen and trying to come to some compromise on things between existing residents, new residents, developers, um, you know, small business folks, what they need to, to see to make happen because collectively we can really help implement these plans and make things happen, but if we, if we fight internally too much, that change will go other places. Uh, it's just will be a reality that we'll have to deal with. So I really want to encourage you to continue this dialogue, stay involved um, you know, through this whole process as we go forward through the rest of this year and then implementing the, the rest of the plans ongoing from that will be a multi-year effort. Uh, with that, I do want to, I think we're, we're out of time for questions, but uh, I don't want to keep you guys any longer. But if you have questions, the, the design team and Kurt and myself will be up here to answer any questions. Um, and with that, I want to uh, acknowledge real fast Kurt Upton right there for those of you that don't know. sleeping about three hours a night uh, and working on various things in between. He does have some great staff uh, who's helping him too. Lissa's around here somewhere. There's Lissa. Uh, Josh Bednarik is around here somewhere too. There's other project partners too that I, I um, am not going to be able to mention right now, but I encourage you to visit our website for folks like uh, St. Luke's Health Initiative, uh, ASU, Braden's over there. There's a number of project partners that are making this uh, happen in addition to HUD. And it's really through that collective action and the work of you guys that we can help make these plans a reality. With that, thank you and have a very good night.